So this is a photo of the source material for my next couple videos. I'm going to be building a chair quite similar to this. The customer and I made a few um, minor changes, but in general, this is the basic structure. So the first thing I wanted to do was bend the legs because I knew that was probably going to be the hardest thing to bend just because they're so thick. So I'm basing all of my dimensions off of, I actually have a chair couple oak chairs in my possession that are a little bit similar to this so I got a lot of the dimensions from them but basically you could see what I'm doing here is I'm making sure my legs are gonna stick out long enough so that my base is wide enough so the chair won't tip as well as tall enough so this ended up being I think about 17 inch blanks I ended up cutting and I just started by tracing that form um, on a half inch piece of plywood because I was using scrap for this. That's my basic form. Um, I kind of test bent with my ruler to make sure that it was gonna gonna be about the size I needed and then I was able to cut out multiples of these. Since these legs are gonna be two inches thick that means my th my form needs to also be two inches thick. So once I had all those pieces I could glue them all together, um, let them set up overnight and then and then clean it up in the morning. So as far as the steam bending aspect of this project, I'm not going to get into too great a detail about it because last week I, re I released a very long video about how I made my steam box, how I made all these jigs, and kind of basic rules to follow when steam bending wood. So I'm going to run through this stuff fairly quickly. So the next morning I could come in and clean up my form. I'm just kind of removing the glue run out and squaring everything up and I'll use the plane to, to clean up the top edge. So the purpose to steam bend all these parts is so that when you're done, the grain runs continuously through the entire piece. If you just take a slab of oak and trace a pattern on it and cut it out, where the leg bends, you'll be left with short grain, which means the grain will be running um, vertical off the edge of the piece instead of continuously across the whole leg and that's where you run into problems where the chair legs will want to snap off quite easily. So the steam bending just makes for a very structural piece of furniture. So this is my jig and I just kind of drilled a bunch of holes into it. I can knock out the plugs and I'll use these to put clamps in while I'm steam bending. So in order for this to work, I had to buy a very large slab in order to get the blanks I needed for the legs. Um, this is about two inches thick. I didn't plane it down or anything before I started. And you can see I'm breaking it up where the natural lumber would break on the grain and then I'll use that slab. Now this slab was, was kind of expensive because it's quarter sawn oak and it's very thick. So my secondary goal for this project was to be able to save enough of the slab to turn it into something else. You can see now I'm kind of laying out where I want to cut these because the grain cannot run off over more than 12 inches of the wood or it will splinter and fracture. So you can see the grain on here is fairly parallel to the, the ruler I have. Um, a better example of that is on this piece of pine. You can see the grain doesn't run out at all. On this oak, um, especially because it was a slab and there was some figure in the middle, the grain got kind of wavy in spots. So the two, the two misbends I had were mostly due to kind of stretching the limits of what is recommended for bending. So I could piece up the slab. I used a skill saw for all of my rough cuts and then I could finish them up on the table saw. I cut these one at a time because I've never steam bent anything this thick. So I didn't want to slab up my whole piece and then it misbent and I, I had um, to go back to the drawing board with a bunch of miscut pieces. So this is my steam box almost at the recommended 212 degrees. I have heard people say it could be from 200 to 212 and that was pretty much the range I was working with. So I always put it in in an out time just because the nice thing about steam bending is, is you can multitask. I could throw this in the steamer, work on something else for two hours because the rule of thumb is about an inch of steaming time per inch thickness and these I kept in a little bit longer just because as winter is approaching it's a little hard to regulate the heat in the steamer so I ended up keeping them in for more like two and a half hours and I have this tilted on a slant because you can see as that steam condenses uh, it will turn back into water 
and drip out the back side. So this is actually my second attempt. I, did, I, don't, I don't show the first one. I released a video last week um, where I show I show that first bend and it, it was mostly because my my um, my bending jig was was made improperly the first time around. So once I have this in here, you could see the winch I'm using almost, this is a much easier task with two people and the winch kind of makes it almost like a person and a half. There's a lot of forces involved with spending this, bending this lumber and to, to bend something this thick by hand would be really, really difficult. So that winch, I got it at, uh, where did I get that? I got it at Harbor Freight. It was a really cheap winch and it worked perfectly for this. You could see as it turns, you could see in this video that that grain now goes perfectly around my curve. I don't have any short grain on this piece. And then the next day, I believe I could come in and I made a form out of a two by 10 just to attach this to with some pipe clamps because this will have to dry with some sort of structure against it for about a week before I could start working on it. And there it is in there. You could see the metal strap will will dye the backside of your your piece. Um, if you don't want this, wasn't a problem for me because I was going to be sanding these and removing some material. But if you don't want it to dye, you have to remove the bending strap faster than I did. I let mine set up overnight. You could see I have my whole series going, and then this is just another good example of how I pieced out material on this slab. Um, trying to find pieces that would work without any grain run out and like I said the nice thing was was I was left with a very nice chunk of this this live edge oak which is beautiful lumber so I could use it for for something else so that was that was a bonus and I believe this was the last piece I bent so just another close-up um, sometimes the steam would actually because it's um, introducing moisture into the wood, they would come out a little bit thicker and I would have to run to the, the rate alarm saw and chop down a little bit. And at some points, I don't know if you show it, they, one of them came out a little small. So I just added a shim into the end of the bending form because you want it to be tight against that bending form. And then you could see as I go, I add clamps to to get it to be a nice fit along that bending form I did bend two pieces you'll see it later in the video with some minor knots of them because I was running out of lumber and they ended up coming out a little bit of a different shape than the two other ones this ended up not being a huge problem for me because I had two that were the same size and two that were the the same size so I just used them in opposite ends of the piece and it worked out fine but um, you really should avoid using using pieces that have knots in them. So this was my first bend. You could see the bending strap on the back. This is why it broke. My strap wasn't wide enough. Um, and it also twisted because the strap wasn't strong enough to bend it. Twists are gonna be a huge problem in steam bending. That's why you continually see me hammering down the piece. And this is the piece I bent that had too many knots in it. You could see right where the knots are, the, the wood actually fractures and starts to break apart and wrinkle. So this one just had way too many knots. The other two I was, I was talking about earlier, the knots were much smaller, so I was able to get away with it. But um, this one didn't have twists in it, but it still wasn't usable. So you want to make sure you're constantly um, hammering that material down because if you have twists in it, nothing will turn out square in the end. So for the central portion of this, I had this large block of red oak, which once this piece is finished, you won't be able to tell that this is red oak versus white oak. And this is what I was gonna use for the middle. There was some surface checking in it, which wasn't a big deal. So um, I don't have dimensions on this because I actually did, never measured it. It was just kind of big enough for what I needed. So that's what I went with. So you can see I'm squaring it up on the table saw after playing it down. And these are the two different size legs. You can see that they both work. One just ends up a little bit taller on my form than the other. So I kind of made a rough mark of where I wanted to attach these because I decided to attach these with dovetails. Um, I wanted something super structural to attach them. It was a very long process but I don't think they'll ever break apart. So you could see I kind of drew 45s on my pieces and then marked out my dovetails using a ruler. These were kind of rough, rough measurements. 
and then I put those on all four of my corners. Now the mark on the back side is the width of the leg. So I have two inches in the back, which gave me that one inch in the front. And I'm not cutting all the way through this because the legs don't go all the way down. So these are all gonna be stopped uh, dovetails to kind of see how the leg is going to fit on that piece. So this was multiple cuts because the saw only tilts to one side. So I kind of had to get a little clever with how I was doing this. So the first thing was easy. I could go through and cut off um, 45s on those edges to get my first bends. Then from there I could move the fence and because the second cuts were also going to be 45, I put a mark around how the depth I wanted to go as well as a mark on the table saw so when they lined up I knew I could stop it. So I would turn off the saw, um, back up the piece, and then cut again. So these are all 45s. I could go through and cut these ones as well. You can see I'm not following my lines perfectly because I'm going to clean these up with a chisel at the end. And this piece was fairly square when I started doing this, but it wasn't perfectly square. So you'll also notice that sometimes the marks don't line up. So then the next cut, I believe this was a twin, about a 22 degree angle. I used my eye to line up that angle with um, my mark so that I didn't have um, an accurate cut for that because like I said I just lined it up and I could go through and make those cuts on the sides. And this was the same process. I would just move the blade so that it lined up with my marks, make a cut and then stop it, back up the piece and then rotate it until I had all the cuts for that certain angle. So you could see I'm able to make all four of these cuts as well. Then you can see I'm just tilting it. I would walk to the back side of the table, line it up with my eye, and then make the cut. So this is also a different angle, making that cut on the other side. Now the nice thing about the marks not necessarily lining up, since you're making all the cuts the same way, all of my dovetails turned out to be the same dimension. And then you can see I couldn't make the final cuts. The last one is actually going to be a 90 degree cut. So I raised the blade and turned this um, on the short edge and then was able to rip this down and cut these last marks to leave my dovetails. This one's you can see I'm just adjusting it as I go and getting it lined up with that pen mark. And once this was done, the, the 90 degrees straight up in the air, I had all of my pieces cut. Now the hole in the center was a test run for drilling through this whole piece because the whole piece is going to have to dr be drilled through. It ended up not working, so you'll see later in the video how I drilled through this whole piece. Um, and then, like I said, I could go through and clean it up with a chisel. You can see my edges are left pretty rough, and I'll clean those up later. So now for the legs, even though these turned out really nice, um, the back sides weren't perfectly square. So what I'm doing, the one I just took off the table, I had already squared up. This one isn't squared up, so I'm using my fence and then a flat edge off the base, and you could see there's gaps at the top and the bottom of the bend, and that's just kind of the nature of steam bending. So I used a very thin shim, this is actually metal key stock, to mark a straight line, and then I just used the hand plane to square up the back sides of these pieces. That's so that when I go to put the receiving end of the dovetail in here, everything will be nice and flat when sending it across my table saw. So you, the one before was finished, this one wasn't done. You could see how it, it, it wasn't square on the fence. So I did that to all four. So then to start cutting these, I put a three quarter inch dado down the center of all of the pieces. And that is be just to make life a little bit easier when cutting the dovetails because the backside of all of the dovetails is three quarter of an inch. And I sent all these through. They're a little bit different in width minorly, so I did make some adjustments as I went. You could see that I tilted the blade. I believe this is about a 15 uh, degree tilt. And then I could cut the angle I need on my pieces. So I could go through all of them and cut that angle just following my marks. And the marks I took right off the, the, um, the pedestal base that I had already cut. Now the problem I have here is I can't, usually to cut the other side I would flip these around, 
but you can't see um, where where you're cutting it because it goes up in the air usually I would line it up from the other side so what I did was I just placed it on the back end of the saw cut and lined it up that way so you can see I'm lining it up on the back end here I can move my fence and then send it through with the foot side going up and that would give me my other cut on a flat piece this is really easy you could just flip it and line it up with that curve kind of through a wrinkle in the plan so that's what I'm left with I could go through again with a chisel and just clean up that interior portion I take that little extra extra strip out and then um, I could start fitting these so fitting these was a little bit of a task just because everything's a little bit different but I would just go through and clean them up and then I could slide my piece mostly on so that is basically what that is going to look like so once I had them all sliding on and off I now had to go through and finish this so that little piece before the stop part where the saw couldn't cut I had to remove you could see how the legs are a little bit different in height because of the two longer and the two shorter so in order to get these to fit nicely I'm going to curve that dovetail part in order to get all my legs on there at the end of the day two of them will still be a little bit longer and shorter but you'll see probably not in this video but another one how I deal with that and make everything kind of pull together so I just used a chisel to to clean up that bottom edge and I did that as the first step to this process I'm just following the lines of the curves I have so you can see I have a nice square edge there then I could put the leg now each leg is different so I'm marking these legs for each particular dovetail as I go I can mark that curve you'll I'll fill it in with sharpie later and then you'll see um, how that gets finished so there's the portion I have to remove and I just use chisels to remove it I would test fit constantly so I didn't go too far remove a little bit more test fit and then get it to fit nicely and like I said the two opposite legs run on opposite sides so they matched and then I would put the two shorter legs on the opposite side so they matched so this is just basically going through until it's a nice fit and that leg is square with the top edge of that pedestal I have but you're basically it's a little hard to see in the video but I'm just following the the cuts that I already have on on the dovetails so that curve is the same cut you can see it eventually starts to slide further and further down down the piece now I'm left with a little bit of a gap and that's just the nature of the way that the dovetails were cut um, that was only on two of them so I I'm gonna have to fill those in probably it, the gap is big enough that I'll probably put a chunk of wood in there and you won't even notice it's there so when those two were on I could do the other two and you could see that my sharpie marks go a lot further than the other two and that is just for the difference to make up for the difference in the height between the two bent legs and so once they're all in place you can see now it's completely square on the bottom but the top one leg sits lower and um, like I said you'll see later how I finish that up to drill the hole um, I had access to a drill press that had a continuous shaft I wish all drill presses had these it makes end boring a very simple task um, the end boring jig on my drill press just wasn't big enough so I use an inch and a half spade bit and I have it clamped to the table as well as clamped in place because this spade bit is going to want to move around on you a lot and what I did was I would drill a little bit add in an extension into the drill press drill a little bit more and you could see I have a final extension in there and that got me about halfway through then I flipped the piece and drilled from the other end and I was able to go through the whole thing this is a little over 13 inches deep and I ended up with a nice square hole at the end um, I didn't drill all the way through on the drill press I left about a quarter of an inch you could feel in the spade bit when you're getting close and that's just because these spade bits have a tendency to catch I didn't want it to catch in there so I finished it out um, with hand drilling so I have a really long extension for my drill and I could just uh, pop out the rest of that plug so then I would I could um, add the the metal piece through the center of this 
So the metal piece I have for this is actually a scaffolding extender, and that is what is going to be used to raise and lower the seat. So this is going to be the end of part one. I believe this is going to be a three-part series. The second part is going to be making the, the seat top, and then the third part will be all the little final touches and finish. And um, the order of operations in this video is not accurate. I actually kind of worked on the whole chair simultaneously, but it made more sense to break it up into making the bottom, the top, and then finishing it. So there'll be a lot more steam bending parts as well as um, non-steam bending parts.